from the station working for you. This is WRTV News at 6, streaming now. More violence at a local apartment complex. A woman becomes the fourth person killed there since June. The new information we are learning. He was kidnapped from our house um, and held for uh, six or seven days. Turning tragedy into a purpose, how one Indianapolis teenager impacted by the death of her brother is now being rewarded for her hard work. You can't let people come back and then be mad when they come back. Like, I don't get that at all. Eight Greek houses on IU's campus are now under quarantine two weeks into the semester. We have the latest from Bloomington. And happy Friday. Welcome to the News at 6 on WRTV. I'm Amanda Starantino. Mark Mullins has the evening off. Some areas of central Indiana have seen extremely heavy downpours like this one right here in Fishers this afternoon. Other parts of the viewing area have stayed dry. Let's get right to Chief Meteorologist Kevin Gregory, who is tracking the potential for more storms later tonight. I mean, it's typical Indiana weather, Kevin. <laughs> Absolutely. That humidity sky high, which leads to heavy rainfall. But if we look at the big picture headlines, the humidity will be dropping. Look at the comfort that's on the way for Sunday morning. Let's hop to the radar. No rain in the metro area at this moment. We're going to drop to the south around Nashville, Hills of Brown County. Couple of downpours there. Also north of Lake Monroe here, anywhere along State Road 46. We'll go to the west of Bloomington. See how these just Dot the landscape, they'll continue to move actually from southeast to northwest and will continue to play this game where we have isolated showers and thunder showers, especially southwest of Indy for the next several hours. A steamy night on the football field. Temperatures stay in the low 80s for kickoff. The risk for severe storms later tonight, probably after midnight, a little higher for northern Indiana. I think the storms that we inherit then will start to lose steam as they come through. As far as rainfall potential, maybe another half an inch in spots if we're lucky with the overnight showers and thunderstorms. A private security guard has been released after being detained in connection to a fatal shooting at a northeast side housing complex. This is the same complex where three other deadly shootings have occurred since June. IMPD responded just after midnight to the 4100 block of North Brentwood Drive near East 42nd Street and North Post Road. When police arrived, they found the woman who had been shot. Officers say there was a gathering of at least 30 people at the scene. Investigators say emergency crews took the woman to a local hospital where she later died. She has not been identified. According to a tweet from IMPD's official Twitter account, a private security guard hired by the housing complex was detained but police say the security guard has since been released pending further investigation. No arrests have been made. Metro police say the security guard is not associated with any local, state, or federal law enforcement agency. And like we said, three other fatal shootings have occurred in the same housing complex since June. Zaire Heron died in a shooting on June 19th on Hampshire Court. A week later, Ronald Morris was killed on, 26, on June 26th on North Brentwood Drive. And Sean E. Hicks Jr. was fatally shot on North Brentwood Drive on July 30th. Again, with this morning's shooting, that makes four fatal shootings in this apartment complex since June. Tonight, an Indianapolis teenager whose brother was found dead in that very same area on the northeast side two years ago is now turning her pain into purpose. Our Nicole Griffin is showing us tonight how the tragedy sparked a passion in her and the reward she is now receiving. He endured a brutal death, I'll just say that very, very, very brutal. In January of 2018, Trayvon Mann was found dead at 42nd and Post Road. His mother says he was just 19 years old and a young father. He was shot eight times in the head, two in the chest. Every bone in his face was broken. All his teeth was pulled out and he was set on fire. He was unrecognizable. We had to... Um, recognize him by his hand tattoos. Since his death, Trene Mann, his younger sister, has been diagnosed with depression, anxiety, and PTSD. We thought like the same thing was going to happen to me. We was getting a lot of calls and stuff like that, telling me to I was going to be next and stuff like that. So it really took a toll on me. Despite no arrest in the case, Trene was determined to push forward. She moved to a new school and had a successful high school basketball career. She's now a freshman at Indiana State University, majoring in criminal justice and criminology. I took that route specifically because of my story, because of my brother. And I know like what specifically what happened to him. I wanted to know like 
why did this happen to him? Like, what made those people do this to him? Because of her determination, she was awarded a scholarship for $2,000 from Purpose for My Pain, an organization created by Deandra Dykus, whose son was shot when he was 13 years old. You don't find too many African-American women in criminology or in the police field or anything like that. So for her to choose a field like that in honor of her brother, I'm excited. Trené is the very first recipient of the When Life Gives You Chocolate, Make Hershey Scholarship Fund. That is a saying Deandra's son Dre used to say before he was shot. Since he can't go to college himself, Deandra wants to help other families impacted by gun violence achieve their dreams. Working for you, Nicole Griffin, WRTV. Quote, we are hurting and we demand change. A strong statement from the Colts today. Players and coaches standing as one talking about how they plan to initiate real change in the community. Thursday's day off practice was spent with the team as a whole, registering to vote. They want more of the same in our city. We understand that our job awards us with a platform to pour into our resources, our relationships, to not only make change on a surface level, but use the communication with those, to, to use the relationship and the communication that we have with others that can help change and deep rooted change. We said we were not gonna be passive. We weren't gonna be neutral. And I think what you've seen demonstrated by our players and what you'll see demonstrated by our organization is a focused fight um, against injustice. Lucas Hill Stadium will be a polling site on Election Day. The Colts practice there tomorrow. That NFL regular season starts in just two weeks. And we are learning that the NBA playoffs will resume Saturday. Players and teams across the league boycotted Wednesday night's games in a show of solidarity against racial injustice. This happened in the wake of the police shooting of Jacob Blake in Kenosha, Wisconsin. The boycott continued for Thursday's games and is continuing tonight. But tomorrow the playoffs will resume. Today, the league and the National Basketball Players Association released a joint statement saying they will immediately establish a social justice coalition made up of players coaches and owners. That coalition would focus on issues such as voting access and advocating for meaningful police and criminal justice reform. Today, ton, tens of thousands of civil rights advocates are in Washington, D.C. in commemoration of the 1963 March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. They gathered at the steps of the Lincoln Memorial where Martin Luther King Jr. delivered his historic I Have a Dream address that shared his vision for racial equality. Today's March on Washington happened as protests continue over the police shooting of Jacob Blake. The civil rights advocates in attendance today called for voter action, police reform, and criminal justice reform. The number of new COVID-19 cases in Indiana has decreased, but the number of new deaths is up a bit. The Indiana State Department of Health confirms 832 newly reported cases of the coronavirus. That is down from more than 1,100 newly reported cases yesterday. 91,313 people in Indiana have been diagnosed with COVID-19 since the pandemic started. The state also reports 11 new deaths, which is up from yesterday. A total so far of 3,058 Hoosiers have died from the coronavirus. 1,044,049 Hoosiers have been tested for COVID-19. 8.7% of them tested positive for the virus. COVID-19 testing at Indiana University has found a big increase in positive cases within Greek houses. The university has directed all houses to suspend in-person activities other than dining and housing for live-in members. WRTV Stephanie Wade is in Bloomington tonight speaking with students and university officials. The Monroe County Health Department has instructed eight Greek houses on campus to quarantine, meaning all members must stay inside their houses for 14 days while I use public health officers continue to monitor other houses as well. I'm really happy to be back on campus, but with that comes, you know, the like anxiety and fear of getting Corona. I think what's happened that differentiates those eight houses from others is that there were enough cases that, that we felt that it would be almost impossible to make a determination of who was not a close contact anymore. Upon arriving on campus two weeks ago, all students, faculty and staff were tested for COVID-19. If they tested positive, they could either leave campus and quarantine at home for 14 days or be isolated in one of the 564 designated residence hall rooms. There's like this idea that it's just Greek life that is like going crazy and doing all these things. But like, first of all, there's not even really any 
Greek parties going on right now. I totally get like people shouldn't be going out in like big groups and stuff, but also like we're college kids and like I feel like they should have expected that. University officials say it's hard to tell how the students contracted the virus, whether on campus or outside IU. Right now, there is only a 1% positivity rate for the entire student body, but the Greek house cases are driving a significant amount of the overall numbers. This is a particular problem with those particular housing units because they are smaller, they do have a more concentrated population, and it is frankly something that we were concerned about from the very beginning. We will likely test all of our on-campus Greek students again next week as well, uh, to make sure that we're picking up every single positive as it comes along and getting it into isolation. In-person organizational activities are suspended until at least September 14th. And from here on out, the university will be conducting testing at random. Mitigation testing will be going on all semester long. And I should add that this is not just at IU Bloomington, it's at IU PUI, it's at all of our campuses throughout the state. So we'll be testing students, faculty, and staff uh, on a random basis. And that's really just to make sure that we have a handle on where there might be some outbreaks. I really hope like we get to stay on campus and I you know, think they're trying to do the best they can. Stephanie Wade, WRTV. A list of houses directed to quarantine can be found at studentaffairs.indiana.edu. No other IU residence halls are under quarantine. In Grant County, Northview Elementary School will be closed for two weeks after multiple people were diagnosed with COVID-19 and dozens of others were exposed. The superintendent of Mississinawa Community Schools says the school in Gas City will be closed through Friday, September 11th. All classes will be virtual until students and staff return Monday, September 14th. The superintendent says the school had three confirmed cases of COVID-19 over the past couple of weeks and approximately 60 students were exposed. Eight staff members at the school were also exposed to the virus and one tested positive. On Monday, IPS will have even more student support network sites open to help with remote learning. IPS has begun the school year with 100% remote learning for all district students. The hope is that kids will be able to return to in-person learning by October 2nd. The support sites offer a safe and structured place for IPS students to attend when families need a supervised environment for their children during remote learning. On Monday, the YMCA will open a student support site at Carl Wild School 79 on West 34th Street. And the organization at your school will open up support centers at Robert Lee Frost School 106 on Roxbury Road and Broad Ripple High School on Broad Ripple Avenue. IPS parents and guardians will need to register their students in advance and arrange for transportation to and from the student support network site they attend. Kevin. Temperature today hit 86 degrees, and you may say, <clears throat> excuse me, it feels warmer than that. That's certainly the case in some spots. Heavier downpour south of Bloomington, also near Nashville. We'll have a forecast for your Friday night football. Let's check in with Dave now. It's a game nearly 10 years in the making. Carmel hosting Cathedral. This is a big, big matchup and already week two of Friday football in Indiana. That story, we'll talk live with John Heaver, the head coach of Carmel, coming up in just a bit. A developing story from WRTV investigates more than 120 employees are being impacted by the closing of two Howard County health facilities in the midst of the pandemic. Replay Physical Therapy Clinic and Community Howard Specialty Hospital will both close this Sunday. Community Health Network says it's because of the changing landscape of health care. But WRTV investigates found that the layoffs and closures are happening even though the health care system got more than $200 million in federal stimulus money. Community Health Network issued this statement to WRTV. It says, quote, we worked closely with impacted employees to match as many as possible to other openings within community. We have made every attempt to ensure that patients have a smooth transition to other quality care options within the community. End quote. Kevin. 615, no surprise, this table for four just outside the RTV6 back door was available. Heavy downpour this afternoon, much needed rainfall. 
probably not as much as we need, certainly, but we'll take it as we get it. There are many opportunities for rain within the seven day forecast. I think this evening, most of us are going to be dry. As you take a look at the radar, most of the action down in Brown and Monroe counties from Nashville over toward Bloomington, just not any solid areas of rain. What will happen is we'll wait for the next trigger for more showers and thunderstorms. That will come with a cold front later tonight, really through the overnight. Just north of Nashville, along State Road 46 west toward Bloomington, some downpours, then from Sullivan down to around Vincennes. As far as the temperature trend over the next Next few days. We talk about the humidity dropping this weekend. Be patient because I think tomorrow, certainly the first half of the day, still very humid. Humidity will drop and the temperature will as well. Sunday, the most comfortable day, not only of the weekend, but I think the most comfortable day in the seven day forecast. Temperatures next week stay below the average of 84. There's the dip, a noticeable change in the way it feels. That leads to a cool start on Sunday morning. Humidity starts to come back as we go through next week. Temperatures at 83 tomorrow with a morning chance for showers, but that's fairly limited. I think the threat will end early 79 and dry until potentially Sunday night when some showers or thunderstorms may return. There's your small chance for showers through the day tomorrow, 20% or less. So go with your outdoor activities. If you have a shower, that's just unlucky is the way to look at it. There's your north wind 10 to 20 miles per hour tomorrow. That does two things. It starts the temperature falling late in the day, but it also brings in the drier, more comfortable conditions that will be around. Breezy, falling humidity, temperatures upper 70s to low 80s in Indy. Some spots may hit 85 to the south. There's your Sunday planner. Temperatures in the 50s in the morning hit 79 in the afternoon. By Monday, we're back to 81. The chance for showers and thunderstorms will increase a bit as we go through next week. Daily chance 30 to 40 percent. Temperatures no warmer than about 84 on Tuesday. But whereas the lows are in the 50s Sunday morning, they'll be back in the upper 60s next week. Amanda. Thank you, Kevin. A bittersweet announcement here at WRTV. After 23 years at this station, Sports Director Dave First will officially sign off on September 9th during the WRTV News at 6. He'll be joining IndyCar as their Vice President of Communications. Dave, we're all heartbroken here, but we're so proud of you. It's about to be the end of an era at <laughs> WRTV, but congratulations on your new job at IndyCar. It couldn't be a more perfect fit for you. Well, yeah, really looking forward to it. Uh, the, the beauty of this business is I'm standing in Indianapolis and still very much feel a part of the WRTV family. So that, that's not going to change. Just the job's going to change a little further west down 16th Street. But yeah, uh, so much. Very looking forward to joining the folks at, at IndyCar. A tremendous staff, very talented uh, group, very passionate about the sport. And, and I'm just a very small very small part of that so to have the opportunity to join this group uh, and, and to help get the word out about IndyCar. I know everybody in Indianapolis knows how special this board is, certainly what it means uh, to the city of Indianapolis. To help spread that word globally uh, is going to be very, very cool. First things first, though, uh, we've got week two of high school football, and this is a huge, huge game. Behind me, Carmel's warming up. Uh, they just played a game week one last Friday against Plainfield and beat the Quakers 31 to 6. This is a rarity, though, for the Greyhounds playing Cathedral. They haven't played the Irish in 10 years. You got to go back to when Mo Moriarty was the head coach of this famed program. He loved the idea of playing Cathedral. So, uh, got to get that old feeling back a, a little bit beginning tonight. In fact, take a look back at last Friday's game uh, against Plainfield as Carmel really took it to, to the Quakers. And they, they got a couple of qu crazy bounces early on in this game as well. But you got to make your luck too sometimes. And that's exactly what the Greyhounds did. A couple of crazy bounces kept an opening drive alive. And then I'm telling you what, they've got a junior quarterback in Zachary Osborne who is really, really fun to watch. And the beauty of it is, as mentioned, he's only a junior, so he's only going to get better not only this season, but next year as well. His main target is a senior wide receiver named Colton Parker. This kid's got some great hands, brought in one touchdown, and he was, again, a guy that uh, Zachary kept looking at on each and every drive. And their running back is outstanding as well. Zachary White, senior running back 
for the Hounds. Throw in their defense, and this is a really, really good football team. Ranked second right now in 6A. Cathedral is ranked third in 5A as well. So uh, this is going to be a big, big game. Highlights of this. We've got other games. Uh, Brad Brown's heading out as well tonight. Highlights of a bunch of games for you tonight on the news at 11 o'clock. we got about 30 seconds or so. John Hebert is the head coach at Carmel. We were just talking about how good this team is. Quarterback, your def defense was outstanding last Friday. Tell me about playing with the pandemic. How have you guys do uh, done it successfully so far, and how do you continue to do it? Well, it's a daily uh, challenge. You know, you you uh, you show up with a game plan, and, and uh, there's always something that you've overlooked. Things take uh, twice as long. Um, you just can't take uh, the opportunities for granted. So uh, I'm really proud of our kids and our assistant coaches, just how hard they've worked. I mean, I, I'm no, I know that's how it is with, with other places, too. Everyone's just so happy to, to get to play a game here. Now we're in week two, so let's strap it up and play. Good luck tonight. Thank you Thank very you. much. Jo head coach uh, John Hebert, big one tonight. Highlights at 11. Until then, the News at 6 continues after this quick timeout. Welcome back. Today's photo of the day comes to us from former WRTV production manager and director Kurt Swader. He took this gorgeous picture of the sunrise over a soybean field in McCordsville. You can see the fog in the background. What a shot of Indiana in the morning, that is. We want to see your photo of the day. It can be anything that makes you happy and is suitable for a family photo album. Email it to <laughs> news at WRTV.com. Come on. We're suitable for a family photo album. Yeah, we know that. <laughs> All right, that was a beautiful sunset and uh, or sunrise. Which was it? It was, yeah, it was beautiful. Um, the chance of a thunderstorm then tonight, 40%. And after midnight, a couple of stronger storms possible. We'll have more on that at 7 and 11. Well, here's your photo of the day looking live outside right now. We'll see you at 7.